person to record the event. Yeah, I think something has popped up uh, in your screen and you can see it now. So as I was saying, on the 11th of the February, we celebrate International Day of Women and Girls in Science all over the world. Uh, and uh, some pre-celebration is happening here by discussing uh, the situation of women and girls in science, how we can foster the collaboration coordination among us and how we can support each other. Uh, and Dr. Joyna will be the host for this event. Tea Time with AuthorAid is a monthly community event of AuthorAid, a project under ENAPS. And here we gather to, uh, to network with each other, to explore the collaboration opportunities and get to know more about what is happening in the Global South. Uh, what else? So I would like to introduce Dr. Zaina first. Uh, let me do that. So uh, Dr. Zainab is a plastic surgeon, former chairperson of the Medical Advisory Committee, CMAC, and former clinical governance lead of the Patient Safety Project at the Federal Teaching Hospital, Gombe in Northeast Nigeria. She is an authored steward. She is a mother of three children, leads a wellness and fitness startup, and a regular, and is also a regular blogger. So a few ground rules before I hand it over to the Dr. China. The first is please maximize the use of all the interactive tools that you can find in the Zoom. Chat box, raise your hand feature, reaction button, because we want it to be very much interactive. Uh, the second is please do not uh, unmute yourself unless you are talking. Uh, if you have to talk, you can raise your hand. And if you are talking in the background, it would also mean that the event is not uh, running smoothly because of the background noises. Uh, we hope that you understand this. And the second, like Tabitha is suing in the form of the emoji, we'd like for you to uh, get ready with your favorite um, cup of something, tea, coffee, any drinks that you like. I'll probably be drinking water. Uh, so yeah. Uh, and is uh, if you have if you encounter any technical difficulties during this time, I would drop my email address in the chat box. You can email me there, or you can just uh, type in the chat box. So with this, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Chai. Thank you so much, Asta, for that introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. Um, I'll just start to share my screen and then we can start. Just give me a second, please. Um, yeah, just give me a second. So my name is Dr. Zainab Vinisa Kaltungo, as um, Asta has rightly introduced, and I'll be taking us today through our celebration of International Day of Women in Science. And my theme will be, or should I say sub-theme will be what I would have told my younger self. So let's go. Just give me a second. I hope this will not glitch and I can share properly. Uh, are you beginning to see my screen? If you can, please confirm. Uh, I you guess you can see it. All right, thank you. So celebrating um, women and girls in science. And I'm Zena Vinusta Kaltungo. I'm primary plastic surgeon and I'm um, an author of its steward. Welcome everybody. So, um, first of all, before we start, let's talk a little bit about the Grimm statistics. And before we talk about the Grimm statistics, I'd like you to bear in mind that for every um, census that's been done, women are at least at the most conservative 50% of the world population. It's more most times, but let's, for the sake of this, let's just assume we're 50% of the world population. And then now let's look at this and project it. It says women scientists are leading groundbreaking research across the world, but despite their remarkable discoveries, women still represent just 33.3% of researchers globally, and their work rarely gains the recognition it deserves. Okay. So let that just sink in for a while. Next, let me tell you a little bit about how I got into science. Um, both my parents were medics, but of course, um, my mom had the biggest influence on me. 
she was a nurse and she was also a soldier in the Nigeria Army. And she never outrightly told me I wanted to study medicine, but you know how subliminal suggestions. Um, Zainab, I think you would um, do better as a doctor. I would have wanted to read medicine, but because of the limited opportunities available to me, I chose nursing. She always told me that reading medicine, if I chose to read medicine, that it would give more room for creative expression of my ideas. And she always, she told us, there was a story she told us a lot growing up. Now, during her posting in the psychiatric ward in her course of her nursing career, that she found out that most times you're supposed to somehow manage to get the patient to take his medication and most times they're forced to take their medication. But she found out that you're able to, if you're able to penetrate that barrier between health worker and patient, you're able to convince most of them to take their medications more. And she always felt that if she was in a position of authority, she would have done that better. So she was always emphasizing that and somehow it got into me and I decided to read medicine. I don't regret reading medicine, but I don't think she was totally, I don't think it was totally an independent decision. So now let's talk about overcoming challenges and then I'll bring in my own specific stories as a woman in science. Um, just like most science fields, surgery is a male dominated field and throughout my training at the time of intake when we were coming in as training as specialists not at the um, undergraduate level to become a doctor but postgraduate training to do surgery there were 10 of us that were taken at that time and there were two women and that's the highest number the institution the oldest postgraduate training institution in Nigeria had taken at any time. So imagine two out of 10, and that was considered a lot. And I always felt, okay, there'll be discriminations along the way, but I always felt, okay, by the time I'm a specialist, I was going to get some kind of recognition. Don't get me wrong. I've never been one to look for external validation, but I always felt I wouldn't have to fight for my seat at the table when I become a specialist, but the story is different. And there was a story um, that happened that I actually wrote a blog post about. So um, surgery department was supposed to join another department in some academic event, and there were external um, assessors who are also specialists in their own fields too. And my husband was um, head of department at that time. He's also a surgeon. And when the introduction was going around, the person who was doing the introduction from the other department, who happens to be several years my junior in training, um, of course, I was, I was seated next to my husband and then he said, oh, and this is Dr. So, 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 his so, so, so specialty. And seated next to him is his smiling wife. And that was all the recognition I got. But I allowed him to go around the introductions. And then I said, um, pardon me, um, Dr. XYZ's wife has her own specialty, she has her own profession, and then the person laughed it off and then introduced me. I want to believe that with the way I went about it, I don't think he's ever going to again address another, introduce everybody by their profession in a professional setting, and then introduce a woman as the wife or so, 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 so. This happens frequently. It still continues to happen, of course, in my institution because they've known, because I have such a big voice and I've been around for so long. It had never happened in this institution, but most institutions, it still happens. And I never let it slide. And I believe I'm not doing it for just me. I'm doing it for the generations to come. And then there's also the issue of finding allies in the profession. Initially, when I came across discrimination in one way or the other, during training, after training, I initially had this 
mindset or the men will always be the ones to discriminate that you only they're only they're the ones who will always want to discount your achievements but i sat down one day and had a heart to heart talk with myself and i said no because to be honest one apart from the fact that this is a male dominated field so if you're going to find allies you're likely going to find male allies and then saying that men are the enemy is not likely to get me anywhere and to be honest i found a lot of support from male folks too naturally because they in they are they are in the majority and i said no i'm not going to paint everybody with the same white brush i'm going to change myself to find what i can get from every situation i will talk about that a, um, a little more in my next slides so it's also important this is something i wish i knew when i started to know that when somebody discriminates against you passes an untoward comment it's about them it's not about you because there's nobody who one realizes the detrimental effects of such um discrimination or who's a happy person or who is a person who's living consciously who is likely to do such so it's about them they have an issue it's not you who has an issue and then i've put here the story of a prof at a conference so um i'm a fellow of the west african college of surgeons that's the body that brings all surgeons in west africa together and um when you qualify you go for a conference you go around west african countries and then that's when you're going to um it's called we call it sometimes graduation so I had finished my training and of course I was very happy. This is where I was going to be conferred with, a fe with the fellowship of the West African College of Surgeons. And then there was like um, a briefing for the new fellows. And as we were rising from that briefing, we we're going towards the hall where we we're going to be sworn in. And then I passed by some elderly prof. Usually you know your seniors, but they didn't know you. I know him, I'd heard about him. And then he was like, oh, you're one of the graduates. I said, yes, happily. I was like, oh, so just so cheap now. Such little girls are now surgeons. Yeah. It hurt. But later, after I had this heart to heart talk, I spoke with myself. I realized if he was somebody who realized the detrimental effects of what he said, who is living consciously, is very unlikely to have said that. And the moment I went through that, I, I it wasn't as if I had a grudge against him, but it didn't hurt me anymore. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I wish he was a more like conscious person to realize that this kind of things are not things that you should say to people. And that means for all of you listening, irrespective of the stage you are in your career, whether you're male or female, because if you're male, you would have sisters, you would have female colleagues, you would have female seniors, you have female juniors. I wish you listened to this so that you can encourage women everywhere to build resilience. And you also need it to whether you're not a woman and of course your determination that irrespective of what obstacle life throws at you, you're going to focus on your goal. So let's talk about the seven pillars of inner strength. The first one says opportunity. So what opportunities can you find around? So let me speak specifically to the author aid community. I would, I would like you to search yourself and ask, am I making the best of all the opportunities available on the author aid platform? When last did you go to the website and decide to check what you can find? And I'll just support that with a little story. I like to tell stories, but I think they drive the point or more. Um, so soon after I joined the author aid community, and that was about the time when I was trying to understand how to do a systematic review. And then I went to the website and I realized, oh, you can actually sign up to get a mentor. And then I signed up for this lady whose field was closest to mine. And she happens to be German. And then I just sent her an email. And you would not believe she'd never met me. She didn't know me and I'm suspecting she probably didn't even do a Google search. I mean, these days if I receive such mails or uh, messages from people, I usually would do a search, do a Google search, check to LinkedIn, check Facebook, know a little about the person. And then she said she was very happy to speak with um, to um, mentor me. 
And then she sent me her manuscript. She was writing a systematic review. Manuscript she hadn't sent in for publication as a guide to me. And she's just, all she said was, oh, I'm not, I'm, I intend to publish this. I've not published it yet. So please don't share publicly. So you see there are opportunities everywhere, but you must search for them. There are very few times when opportunities just land in our laps. Search for them. There are op available opportunities. And Asta was so kind to say that, um, say she would drop her email and you could email her in case if you have any problems. Tea time is a good time when you can network, ask your questions. And then there's this, um, the point of acceptance that you realize that this is the situation that I'm in. This are the surrounding, these are the things that surround the situation I'm in. So which ones can you choose? And I have put here the serenity prayer that says, Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. If you can live by this, it's going to remove a lot of stress from your life. So if you go back to the stories I've told, the prof, the colleague who um, introduced me as a smiling wife of somebody, I can change them. That's who they are. But I can change my reaction to them. I can change myself. I can decide I will speak up in a polite manner at such um, settings when things like that happen so that those who are coming from behind me who are coming um, from behind the younger ones never have to go through that kind of thing again. Then let's talk about solution orientation. There will always be problems in life. And one of my, um, one, um, one of the favorite things I remember about um, some of the lectures that Jim Rohn gave was, he keeps saying, don't wish for a better seed. Don't wish for a better weather. Don't wish for better soil. Wish for better strength better understanding, better wisdom to be able to maximize the opportunities I have. So you have a problem, what solutions are available? And if you really do sit down and ask yourself, solutions will come. There will always be. And if you cannot find one, find allies. I talked about finding allies. Find people that you can go to. Okay, I'm in this, I'm stuck in this position? What do you suggest I do? What ideas do you have for me? And sometimes if they cannot provide the solution, they might point you in the right direction. And also break out of the victim mentality. A harsh way, but true way to say it is get over yourself. I mean, when that prof said that, when my younger colleague introduced me as the smiling wife of somebody, I would not lie, it hurts to a certain extent. But by the time I had gone through that heart to heart talk I'd had with myself and the training I've gone through, I realized I was hurting myself because that event, those events had passed. Those people probably don't remember or will never remember, but it was, I was hurting myself. And that reminds me of a famous um, Hindu philosophy of the um, second arrow that says that the first arrow is the event. It has happened. But you keep going over and over it. Oh, look what happened to me. This is so painful. You're shooting yourself a second arrow. So come out of the victim mentality. And if you actually look deep, all of these challenges, all of these insults are actually opportunities for you to grow, develop yourself, and even if you don't do anything else, say, nah, never again. I'm never going to let this hurt me again. That you can do for yourself. And a success, success network with reference to this presentation is to find who can you align with in the author aid network to help you along your journey. And if we can just briefly go out of the author aid circles, how about where you are, if you are in the university, who are those that can be part of yes, your success yes. network? Sometimes it's success. Um, I'm sorry? Could you please mute if you're not speaking? Thank you. And then your success network also includes those who are close to you, friends, family, because there will be times when there will be stress, there will be challenges, those are inevitable. As they say, rain tax, 
are things that are inevitable. They forgot to add stress. Stress will come, and that is when you need your success network around you. Who are those that will be there to say, yes, I know you're going through stress. If all I can provide is a listening ear, if all I can provide is a shoulder to cry on, those are the people that can help. And your professional colleagues or professional network are those that are going to be able to provide you with this is the way I think you should go about it. So find your success network. And of course, plan for a positive future that is so easy and self-explanatory. And then there's also self-reflection in all of the problems of life. You've got to tell yourself in what ways am I lacking? And for me, with reference to the stories I've told, was me allowing untoward comments to affect me negatively but not anymore. It's something you can do. So self-reflection, what role are you playing in contributing to whatever challenges you're having? Then in addition, what opportunities are available to me that I'm not making use of? What can I do to get myself out of whatever problem I am having? And in addition, if I need support for my mental health, what am I doing about it? Think about that. So let's do a little assignment about building resilience. And then I termed it here, who am I? Who am I and who do I want to become? So I'd want you to think if you have any writing material, get out your writing material. We're just going to jot it down um, short point. So with reference to opportunities, I'd like you to sit down and ask yourself and grade yourself. I'm not going to tell you to accept, I'm not going to tell you to, um, to make public your grading. Think deeply and ask yourself, have I been taking all opportunities available to me? That is in the who am I part, who am I right now? And then after this talk, who do I want to become? So think of one opportunity that you've been passing up. So for example, is there a colleague who is really well-versed in a certain aspect of your work that you've been meaning to speak to, but you never did either because you kept putting it off or you kept thinking the person is going to say no. And they say, you miss every opportunity. You miss every shot you never take. You might not hit every target you aim for, but the more targets you aim, the more you aim, the better you get at it and the higher the possibility you will get one. So answer yourself, have you been taking opportunities and which ones have you made a vow today that I would take, knowing that the answer could go either way. The number two point, acceptance. Who am I at this moment? What are the things that have been going wrong that I've been fighting? How could it be? oh, the economy won't allow me, but there are people who are making it in the same economy. Oh, oh this, the system discriminates against women in science. Yep, it happens. But imagine how um, somebody like Marie Curie must have lived in her time. But we're talking about her now, more than 100 years after her discovery and her death. So who am I? Now let's go to who I want to become. Am I ready? Am I making a promise to myself that henceforth, I'm going to accept the things I cannot change. I'm going to pluck up the courage to change the things I can. And then we we'll also pray for the wisdom to know the difference. Let's talk about solution orientation. Ask yourself honest question. Am I the kind of person that when there's a problem, I just say, there's really nothing I can do about that think about it something will come to mind and now let's go to the next challenge still on solution orientation who do i want to become do i want to be somebody who when there's a problem i'll sit down and calmly analyze is this something that is that i can change or is it something i'm going to accept is there somebody who can help me in finding a solution that success network, am I going to find one, build one now, strengthen the one I have so that I can be a solution-oriented person? 
Let's go to the next point. How about planning for a positive future? So who am I? Am I the kind of person who just feels you only live once? I'll take the day as it comes. And now let's go to the other arm of the assignment. Are you going to sit down now and plan for a positive future for your career, for your family, for whatever, for every aspect of life and set smart goals? It's moved from smart now to smarter. So are you going to plan for a positive future and set goals and work towards them, knowing that I will miss every opportunity I don't go for. I might not get everyone I go for, but the more I go towards my goal, the higher the possibility I will hit my target. Next one. Do I see myself as a victim? Is there a particular situation that I've been in a victim mode? I keep shooting myself a second arrow. Think about it. And then who do you want to become? Do you want to remain a victim? Or are you promising yourself right now that I'm no longer going to be a victim? I'm going to get over myself. And then let's go to self-awareness. Time is running out. I need to move faster. I'm almost done. Self-awareness. Ask yourself, in what ways am I contributing to whatever problem there is? Ask yourself. You can use one situation that comes to mind as an example and then go to the other arm. Who do I want to become? I want to become self-aware, know how I'm contributing, and then decide the way forward. All of these things align. So if you pick opportunities, you'll know that there's acceptance of what you cannot change. You become solution-oriented. You start to plan for a positive future. You break out of the victim mode. You become self-aware. And suddenly, magic starts to happen. Let's go to the next slide. This was something I really wish somebody had told me about. And if you've never heard about it, I think you need to go and read about it. And it's called burnout. It's real, um, a living witness. Um, uh, I suffered burnout, um, just slowly coming out of it. And I would want you to be very aware of it. We cannot talk about burnout today because it's totally out of it, but I'll just quickly run over it. So, it's actually a known mental health issue and usually is characterized by three cardinal signs. One, the cynicism towards your work. But like, I'm just here. Especially the higher you advance in your career, it's particularly common. PhD and the like, who oh, already have a master's degree. I don't even know why I stressed myself to come for this PhD. I mean, I've come for a PhD now. What am I going to get out of it? Or what benefits is it? Cynicism. There's physical and emotional side to it too. So when you think about the work, you're just tired. You just don't have the energy to go on. Physical exhaustion and then mental exhaustion. When your colleagues, you start to treat them as objects. For those of us who are in the medical field, when that patient, when you used to be so concerned about patients, you used to go out to realize that a lot of patients' problems are actually not the medical problems they have come with, but the social circumstances. But when you start to suffer burnout, especially in my case, well, I know the social problems are not mine. I'm here to treat the medical condition. And it is not a good way to go because if you can personally relate to the suffering of others, but without it becoming a problem to you, then you're likely to have a fantastic career. So be careful. I do not want to stress, um, emphasize too much on burnout, but it's so important, and I need you to be aware of burnout. I promise you I'm rounding up, I'm almost done. So I've told you about overcoming failures. Everybody, I've had my fair share of failures, and initially the way I see them, I used to see myself as those failures are painted on my face. And the moment you see me, you do realize, oh, this was the lady 
who at one point, because at a certain stage of my training, one of the postgraduate exams, I failed the exam. And I used to think when the CEO would remember, oh, some years back, um, Zena failed this particular arm of the exam. I realized everybody, we all have problems. And sometimes if anybody chooses to keep remembering your failures, they're not focusing on their own failures, they're focusing on theirs. We all have 24 hours in a day. If they've chosen to take out of their 24 hours to remember your failures and maybe even remind you about it, you need to feel really sorry for them. It's about them, it's not about you. And remember that all those failures, and when I mean all those failures, are an opportunity for you to grow, strengthen yourself. And for those of you who's, um, who knows the song, This Is Me, I think you should listen to the lyrics. It's such an empowering song. And when you listen to the lyrics and you imbibe it, especially the part that says, I'm not scared to be seen and make no apologies. This is me. I'm ready to forge forward because my mistakes are part of what got me to where I am today because I overcame them. I'm stronger for it. I'm ready to face another one. So as we round up, I want you to, this is a call to action. Be the change you want to see. I remember when I was in training throughout, even as medical students, whenever there was like an informal um, departmental activity and maybe there are snacks to be um, passed around, Georgia would choose the females to do it. And initially when I became a senior person, I started, I started to do that until I realized, hello, the MBBS that the female doctor gets is not cheaper or easier than the one the male, the male gets. So wherever I am, no, we either choose one man and one lady to do it, or everybody go get your own snacks. The ladies are not meant to be um, waitresses at informal events. So I didn't like that to now be the change you want to see. Challenge stereotypes. Remember my um, junior colleague that I said, introduced me as a smiling wife of somebody? Do it in a very polite manner so you don't get labeled, oh, that's, I don't know if I'm allowed to use the word, B-I-T-C, H-E lady. That was the impression even I had growing up that, oh, most ladies are grumpy, the higher they go in their career. Even if they are, they're dealing with a lot. So break that stereotype because if you do, whether you like it or not, somebody is probably labeling you. So stop labeling others so that we can make the future more promising and easier for the young girl that is coming behind us. So what does the future hold? For me, I think it's lots of promise. It wasn't, it's getting better, it's slow to get there, but imagine the journey where we were 50 years ago and now. So there's a lot of promise. And I think you should plan for a very bright future. So what will your contribution be? As I close my presentation, I'll just tell you a very short story. We remember the late Nobel Prize winner, Wangari Mathai. One of the conferences she went shortly before her death, she told this very um, compelling story about how there was, it was said that there was a bushfire and all the birds were just um, hovering around the fire and crying, oh, there's nothing we can do, there's nothing we can do. And then there was this hummingbird, you know how tiny those hummingbirds are? And the hummingbird will go, pick a little water in her beak from some water body nearby and just pour on the fire. And then she will go and come and the one of the birds, some of the birds were laughing, what are you doing? She was like, I'm doing my bit, I'm doing the best I can. So it might look like a tiny drop in an ocean, but have you done your bit? So imagine if every one of us here decided to do our bit, it might look like a drop of water in an ocean, but if it is just one girl you can build or one young man that you can teach to change his mind about stereotypes about women in science, imagine the success we're going to record. So, Thank you very much. I'll take questions and answers. Thank you. I'll stop sharing screen now. Thank you, Asta. Thank you so much. Uh, so 
That was a very lovely presentation and we enjoyed it. Very, very inspired. Uh, I am sure that many of us would like to share with uh, each other what we would like to say to our uh, younger self in terms of women and girls in science. So if you want to share anything, please raise your hand, go ahead and share. We would love to listen from you. Uh, maybe while we get the hands up, I will share what I would like to say to my younger self. Uh, to rest more and to take care of oneself health-wise, because uh, I have felt that uh, when you want to achieve a lot of things in life or when you are very ambitious or getting things, you tend to forget that the body and the health is very, very important. And I think I've done it um, more than once. So if I could go back and tell my younger self, exercise regularly, keep a journal, take care of your mental health, uh, enjoy the family gatherings, the small things in life because they won't come again. Um, so also the people in life and, you know, like uh, somebody, uh, wrote it on the Instagram the other day that the earth is a hangout place and we are here for a while. <laughs> Maybe I'll tell my younger self that come hang out in this earth and enjoy while you do other things. So yeah. Uh, anybody else would like to share anything? There's a, there's a question in the chat box. Okay. So she says from Rachel, and she said, um, how do you discover yourself in an academic career environment? Um, the first thing to do is to sit down and decide what do I want? When you say discover yourself, what do I want? One is that you want to get to the peak of your career. If you want to get to the peak of your career, then you've got to set a goal. And in that goal will include one, I've got to know what the requirements are. So go and find out first what those requirements are for me to get to that peak I'm looking at, at that peak I'm aiming to get to. Next, who are those I can bring along on this journey? When I mean bring along, who are those that can be part of my success network? Who is that prof? Who is that colleague that is doing so well that I can approach to help me? And just go through those seven pillars I have talked about. And if you do still have any um, problems, although it is here, we can help to sign up for a mentor and we wish you the very best in your career. Asta? Uh, yes, Jacqueline has shared that uh, that you can never power into others from an empty cup. So it's always uh, putting myself in order first before I can help others. Very intelligent. Yep. And that is one of the very first ways you can prevent burnout. Realize that I've got to fill my own cup first. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Any more questions? Go ahead, please ask that. There, I don't think there are any questions. Uh, a lot of the participants are thanking you for amazing session. So that's mm -hmm. that. Uh, if anybody would like to share, please. Oh, there is a question. Uh, how Joy shares how I as a woman maintain a good family career balance. He wants to ask that. Most husbands will work really hard to frustrate the wives, wives who seem to who seem so be successful in their careers. I think this is a question mm -hmm. for you. I'm sorry, I, I, I think that I was reading through one of the questions. Sorry, Asta, could you, could you read it again? Okay, there is a question from Zoe who says, how I, as a woman, maintain a good family, okay, wait, family career balance. Yeah. Um, one, of my, one of my colleagues who talks a lot about um, work-life balance, she says that thing is a myth. And to some extent, I agree with her. But again, on the other arm, I think it, you've got to be able to set your goals and set your priorities. So, for example, if I'm to tell you my own, if I'm telling my own story, I, I've always wanted to have a family and settle down. But at the same time, I realized that I'm going to have to get to a certain stage of my career 
where I have more muscle to carry all the responsibilities available to me. And I'd like to think that was why I decided to delay starting a family until I was almost done with my postgraduate training, because then I have some level of seniority. I'm not the first point of contact when there's an emergency and I, I'm able to make a lot of decisions on my own. I don't have to wait for somebody to help me to make a decision. But of course, because I was in training, I had to run my decisions by my senior people. So, and somewhere in the middle of that training too was when I started to have, when I um, started to have kids. And I used a success network. I had a um, very good friend from medical school who was in a specialty that was demanding, but not as demanding as, as surgery. And we, our kids were about the same age. So sometimes when my, when my call was um, very busy, she would take care of my kid for me. And sometimes um, once I'm gone at 8 a.m., I probably don't come back until 8 a.m. again the next day just to come and freshen up and go to resume work on another day. So you're going to, one, decide what your goals are, who is part of your success network that can help you, and then you've got to realize you cannot have it all. Don't let motivational speakers push you into saying, oh, I can have it all. Something will suffer. So it's about creating a balance based on what you want and what is realistically possible. And just a very tiny, um, I remember this um, lady, I don't remember her name now, the, um, that was um, CEO of PepsiCo at one time. And she said, um, she thinks because of our position as women, if you choose to have a family, you can't have it all. And then she told the story of how sometimes she's um, halfway across the world and had, I think at that time she had two girls. And when they come back from school, she um, they would call the office. If she's in a meeting, she'll take the call. If she can't take the call, her assistants that will take the call know the checklist. Or so, for example, they'll be like, oh, can, I, can we use a um, device? And then there's a checklist. Have you done your homework? Yes. Have you eaten? Yes. Have you oh, then you can have the device and then you call me back at so, so time. So that very able assistant is part of our success network. Yes, I'm sure she would love to be there to 24 hours around her kids, but she also wanted a career and she would not be happy if her career was not progressing and with all her potentials, she was a stay-at-home mom if that is not what she wants. So it's about you deciding what you want, set a goal, create a success network and maximize um, the potential, the um, opportunities available to you. Thank you. Any more questions? Asta? There are a few questions. Uh, the other is, um, how can one transition from academia to industry considering the experience in academia is limited? One. The other is how I, as a woman, maintain a good family career. Okay, I think we saw this, but there was a question about the African context and uh, maybe the one uh, about the transition can go first and then I will move to, we can move to the next question. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not, I don't think I'm in the best position to address transitioning from the in the, from um, academia, academia into the industrial sector. But again, this is where you're going to need your success network. Who are the people around you that you think might be able to help? And what industry in particular are you looking to go into? Are there people in that industry that you can speak with that can advise you? And Sometimes if you have a particular industry in mind, most industries that are reputable today have a contact us button on their website. Is there somebody you can speak with? Can you book an appointment? Can you speak with them and find out what are my chances? How do I get in? That's the best answer I think I can provide for now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there is another one uh, from Ejira. Uh, sorry if I pronounce it incorrectly. Uh, how does a girl break through from the limiting African culture and religious aspects of gender inequality? And I believe that this is just not the African context, but also the Asian context. Mm -hmm. 
uh, gender mm -hmm. inequality mm -hmm. rooted by yeah, religious social factors. So how do one do that? Um, okay, I got most of what you said. I think my network glitched, but I think I got most of what you said. Limiting um, the culture, limiting beliefs, um, cultural and um, religious things. So let me tell you my part. Let me, let me first give you um, some context to my particular situation. Um, I'm from Northern Nigeria. Northern Nigeria, for those of you who know a little about what's been going on in Nigeria, there's the northeastern part of Nigeria where I come from, we have the poorest indices, both economic, education, and of course the girl child is suffering the most in this part. You remember the, um, there was a school, there was a time when <clears throat> there was this insurgency, it's still, it's still on, and they had this um, pattern of going into schools, boarding schools, kidnapping girls. In fact, some of them are still in cap captivity till today, several years on. So you can now imagine that coupled with the fact that a lot of um, religious scholars in this part of the world give their interpretation, and I like to believe it's a selfish one, to religious teachings. So for example, um, at one point I applied for, for a promotion to a post and one, not one, two traditional rulers sent messages to me that um, women should not be leaders where there are men, according to the religious teaching. Let me, let me, let me first break down um, some things for you. One of those um, traditional rulers at that time, his older sister was a high ranking um, officer in the cabinet, in the ruling cabinet at that time. And then he told me that women do not rule where men are. And then he forgets that in the story of, in the story in Islam, there were so many women leaders. So I'd like to think he was giving his own personal, he was giving his own personal interpretation, whether selfish or not, to this situation. So for you now, as an African, there, yes, there are a lot of stereotypes, but in what way are you allowing those stereotypes to be limiting factors to your growth? For example, I know somebody who said she wasn't going to buy a car because it's believed that when a young lady in my part of the world who isn't married has a car, then she's never going to get married. And I say, well, there's so many women who are wanting to get married, do not have cars, and then they do not have suitors or there's nobody around to marry them. So sometimes even we take on limiting beliefs and limit ourselves. So ask yourself, are these truly barriers or am I contributing and giving more weight to that barrier than what is really there? That's the simple answer I have for you. So. Thank you. Any more? Yes, there are other few. Uh, the other one is how do you get yourself out from burnout, especially if you are not financially stable? And I do think somebody has uh, responded to the question. Okay. But if, right. you, Can you, just if you would like to answer, then okay. that's fine. No, if you could just read out the response. Let me see if I have something okay. to add. It's pretty intense, but I'll read it out. One has to be realistic <laughs> okay. as much as possible. It burn out also blurs your reality. Uh, I suggest you evaluate your priorities and what you can do in your current situation. For example, you'll need fairly good health to elevate your financial instability. So you begin to plan around wellness to reach a state where you can fully meet your financial goals. Consider mindfulness, little exercise, and utilizing support network where one can get them. And I think I agree with the answer also. So if you have anything to add, Dr. China, please. I 100% agree to, but I think the person who has the question, when they say, um, Bernard, considering your financial state, I'm assuming that the person is thinking that the only solution to burnout is to leave whatever profession it is that is causing you burnout. Sometimes it is about you 
And the answer has rightfully addressed that. Mindfulness, to realize that mindfulness, and of course, take some lessons from stoicism, where it says that where there is a problem, there are several options, there are three major options. One is to modify your reaction to that situation, move yourself away from it, which when it comes to finance, you can't just leave any job. And when it says modify your reaction to it, it's like, is it a toxic environment? I can work in such a way that it will not be. It will not, I will not let the toxicity get to me. So do you have a boss who's a toxic boss? Modify your reaction, know that it is about them. They are the one who have issues, not you. And of course, physical exercise has been very helpful, scientifically proven to help. And of course, it's been we talked about mindfulness too. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that response, the person who responded. Yes, that was by Ed, uh, Ed Joke. Uh, I'm not sure the, about the name, but thank you so much for the response. The other is, uh, Tabitha has shared some link to online events on mental well-being. You can check it out. So those are like really helpful. Uh, yeah. There is this question by patients. She writes, given the most, uh, given the most women here in Uganda are lacking self awareness, for example, like from loss of self esteem, your journey is helpful to improve the above and support other members. Though the question is still how. Um, my my response to that will be. One, who are those around you that you can help? You can't help everybody, no matter what. So who are those around you that you can help if you are not struggling with self-esteem? Or sometimes if you're struggling with self-esteem, if you create a circle of people who have similar issues and you support each other, you can build your self-esteem. So it's about one, realizing where you are, what is it that is causing low self-esteem for you? What is it that is causing a lack of self-awareness? Because sometimes it is not every aspect of life. Sometimes it's probably, it might be body image issues. It might be because you're not progressing in your career. It might be because somebody is, um, it might be because somebody, is, it might be because of a toxic work environment. So be aware of where the problem is and then start to seek how you can find um, solutions know what aspect of life is responsible for your um, low self-esteem and then make a plan to break out of it. And of course, if you cannot, if self-help isn't working, I'm sure in all of Uganda, there are um, um, professional networks, people who can help you, experts who can help you with your self-esteem. Thank you. Yeah, do I go to next question? Although we have like, we can take two more questions maybe because we started a little bit late. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, what advice would you give uh, someone who is looking for mentorship at a later age in their career context? I feel like uh, it's easy to look for mentorship when you are just starting out in your career or young, in, young, but when if you have been in a particular career for over 10 years and feel like you are not making progress, how do one look for a mentor? Luckily, um, author aid has solved that problem. You can sign up for a mentor on the auto aid website and um, some like auto aid Nigeria recently we just concluded a um, an online mentoring program with a lot of success not as big as we'd want it but a lot of success so yes the beta has posted again so please sign up for a mentor and then that issue of age I think it's a limiting belief because if you've ever read about mentorship you realize that mentoring is not about your age. For example, I turned 50 last year and I have a mentor in a certain aspect of life who is just 35. And there are times when I am mentor to that person and the person mentors me. So please do not let age be a barrier. You can find a mentor. Anybody can mentor you as long as they have what it takes. Please, 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 age is not a barrier. And you might think that it's easier, but as long as you've opened up yourself to learning, 
you can achieve a lot of things irrespective of your age. Thank you. Thank you for the response. There is another thing, uh, another question by Jacqueline who asked, how could I use Authority to create a success network? And I think Tavita has answered most of it. Uh, sign up, seek the mentors. Uh, we have live event every now and then. We also have MOOC, we have master classes. So those would be of help. Uh, I think that sums up the using the author aid and I would also share you uh, the important link at the end. Uh, so recording of the event will be shared. Uh, hello everyone, uh, recording, recording. Wait a minute, I'm trying to go down. Uh, ha, ha, ha. I think we had, okay, there is this another thing. How do you deal with burnout? Sometimes it happens that you burn out because it does not work out because of the negativity from the outside. Where do you find the motivation to move on? Tapita has linked uh, the past well-being events, but if you would like to answer because you are like a pro person in this, so go ahead, please. Um. First of all, if I'm to use myself as an example, you must, I would suggest that you find what particular aspect you're responsible for your burnout. So for example, for me, I realized that the, most of my burnout was because as a human being, as a person, I think I'm disproportionately sensitive to human suffering. As a medical student, when I have patients who were terminally ill, most times, I never cried in front of the patients, but I would find a corner and cry for them. I still remember when I was younger, watching the TV, watching the feminine in um, Ethiopia then. It was just the, the news to everybody in my household. But at night, most times I was awake crying, seeing children so malnourished, even though I was just a child myself. So when I realized that, I realized it was because of the way I was overtly sensitive, too sensitive to human suffering, which is not entirely a bad thing, but because it is causing problems for me, I realized I needed to be able to find strength in knowing that there are certain things I can't control. I can't, I can't do everything. And because of that, I realized the less I got myself involved in social problems that the patient has, and I do the minimum that is necessary to get the patient out of the situation, then I think I have done something for the patient. And just a quick story. Um, just to this Friday, I ran an outpatient clinic two days ago, and then I got this patient who had, um, had this spinal injury some 23 years back had been to several doctors before he came to this hospital for 23 years and nobody ever explained to him why he was having the problems he was having and he stayed very far away and he had also been referred to see the neurosurgeons and when I told him that neurosurgeons run their clinic on Mondays my clinics on Wednesdays I was like neurosurgeons need to see you now you've seen me on a Wednesday so which would you prefer? Would you, if for example, you saw them next Monday and I need to see you again on a Wednesday, would you like to go and come back? I was like, no, that financially and also because of the difficulty moving him around, it was going to be difficult for him to see a doctor on a Monday, go back to the village where he stays and then come back again on a Wednesday. So if you would prefer to stay. Now, because we use electronic booking system in my hospital, it's going to be, it was going to be a little hard for me to book him for, to fight to book him, just give him an open booking. So what I did was, considering the social situation of the patient, was to give him a note that he was going to hand over to the neurosurgeon to give him a booking the first Wednesday after the neurosurgery clinic, because I was not sure when he was going to be able to see the neurosurgeon. And then he ended there. In the past, Zena would have gone to look for the neurosurgeon try to get an appointment, exact appointment for the neurosurgeon, have an idea when the neurosurgeon would want to see the patient so that I could give him a booking. 
that was going to cause a lot of stress for me. But even this little I had done, the patient was very happy with. And I went, I met the nearest um, surgeon in Theta, in the operation Theta yesterday. And I spoke with him, I was like, oh, you're going to get a note from a patient. And I think I have done my best. I'm not getting paid for that social aspect, but I know I have made life easier for the patient without draining myself. Thank you. Long story, and I hope you're able to get the moral of the story. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, shall we take one more question or end the session here? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. No, no. Monira had her hand up. Okay, okay, so let's hear from her. You can, okay. I think, unmute. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you yes. are. Ah, okay. Uh, thank you very much for the nice uh, program. Uh, may I share what I feel to say myself at the younger age myself like this, or should I ask a question or should I proceed? Uh, ask that. Actually, can you please I have, come again? Actually, what I understood that as a participant, we can share what we feel to uh, say younger ourselves as a uh, women in science. Can I share something like this? Of course, yes. Okay, please thank go you. Ahead. Okay, let me let me introduce myself first, very shortly. I'm Moni Rajanathal Kobra. I'm from Bangladesh. I work in the Department of Physics, University of Rashi. This is the one of the largest public university of Bangladesh. I brought up in a very remote uh, village in Bangladesh. Uh, so the communication system that time was not good. So I just listened that, okay, uh, you have to study. Yeah, my father used to tell me, okay, you have to study in university, but I never had any real picture of university, but now I am a faculty member, something like this, my story is. So after, okay, after uh, what I did in my younger self, uh, younger age, I should I studied very well like this, and I eventually get uh, admitted in a good university and did good result. And after that, just immediately I went to ICTP for my post graduation diploma, and then I did my PhD. So what I feel being a female or women in science in Bangladesh, because in Bangladesh nowadays, uh, there are so many girls are studying science. There is no barrier until at least university level. But what happened after the university graduation, girls are not, uh, not doing much good because they are just uh, involving with family life and they they feel like, okay, they are not doing good in a post-graduation level of studies. But I would say myself, if I was the, that younger stage that you should resilience what the host already shared. Resilience is important, but also to be confident. I'm confident it should be actually accepted by my uh, colleagues or by my classmates or somewhere uh, my net within my network. More another thing I would say: do networking. Networking is very much important nowadays. But another thing I must say, do the, see the bigger picture because what I'm doing, I'm contributing for the science. I am a physics faculty member, my research area, nuclear science. So what I am doing for the science, the bigger picture is important. Sometimes we uh, stay in a, I can say, some isolated place, right? In developing countries, sometimes it happens. We are in isolation, academic isolation. We uh, sometimes demotivated. So it's very much important to see the bigger picture and also connect with the uh, within my network, like this authority to this meeting, of course, uh, helping me to get more, more motivation because I'm seeing the girls, mostly girls from different parts of the world. So now we have the access of internet. So do, the, at the end, I must say, be confident, show that your confidence, do network and try to connect with the role model and see the bigger picture. That's it. Thank you very much. Asta? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yes, networking and everything is very, very important. Uh, it is almost 4 p.m. my time, which is um, 
15, 12 minutes more than what we have um, anticipated. So I think uh, we should move towards the end of the program. What do you think, Zainab? I agree. I agree. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. We'll take a picture at the end. So we'd like for you to turn on your video. And thank you so much, uh, everybody, for sharing your experiences and being very interactive in the session. So I have shared a few links here. Uh, so you can stay connected with Authorate via various means. You can sign up for our website, Authorate.info. I will send it here too. Uh, and you'll receive the constant updates. Uh, so you, we have a community of more than 15,000 scholars from around the world. So you can sign up there. It is a Google group. Uh, we do have Twitter where we are constantly sharing our updates, our events, and other opportunities that might be of interest for the scholars. So you can follow us on Twitter and stay connected there. We do have Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Please stay connected there. You can contribute the resources uh, that might be useful to scholars from around the world and that you have found uh, helpful in your scholarly journey. Uh, you can contribute it there. You can also contribute the blogs and articles about your opinions, experiences, and many other things about your research or other findings. Uh, so you can contribute from the link provided in the chat box. And we have a masterclass happening on 20th of the February from 12 to 14 GMT. Uh, it is on designing an effective publication strategy. And I think that it would be very helpful to most of us. I myself, and very, uh, myself am very much looking forward to the session. So uh, we'd love to see everybody there. Please sign up for the event if you are interested. It is uh, the signing up process is similar to that of the tea time. If you encounter any problem, you can let us know and we can help you. With that, let's take a picture. And if everybody is comfortable, please turn on your uh, video or else we can move ahead. Yes. Happy to see everybody here. Uh, and thank you so much, Dr. Jaina, our author steward for such an amazing season. We loved it to the core. Thank you and looking forward to many more in the upcoming days. Uh, with that, let me take a picture. You can pose as you want, uh, something formal, something funny. So I'm in the slide first. Uh, so we have two slides, I think. Uh, so please smile. Uh, I'm not forcing anybody to smile. I hope everybody is happy. Uh, you can uh, do something funny now. Okay. And moving on to next slide. Uh, please smile. And maybe something funny or something fun. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. I've taken a picture and please stay updated in our socials to see how the picture has come out. <laughs> we'll be posting them there and see you in our masterclass. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.